Welcome to NOAA Live Alaska. My name is Lisa hiruki Rari, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is a collaborative effort by NOAA Fisheries Alaska Fisheries Science Center, where I work, NOAA's Alaska Regional Collaboration Network, and NOAA's National Weather Service. This webinar series is designed to help you get to know NOAA's work in Alaska and how we connect and work with your communities. NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, studies the ocean and the atmosphere and where the two meet from weather to ocean to the animals that live around us. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA or work in partnership with NOAA. We hope this gives you a sneak peek at different career paths that you might be interested in. Today, we're introducing you to Dr. Jessica Cherry, who works for NOAA's National Weather Service's Alaska Pacific River Forecast Center in Anchorage, Alaska. While we'll be talking about NOAA's role in research and stewardship, we want to recognize that we're all coming to you from the traditional lands of native communities who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. In Alaska, Jesse's work is conduct conducted all over the state, which include the traditional homelands and waters of the Inupiat, Yupiat, Siberian Yupiat, Athabaskan, An Unanga, Alutit, Iyak, Klinkit, Haida, and Simshin. We're honored to acknowledge that Jesse is presenting this webinar from Anchorage, Alaska, the, the ancestral land of the Denaina people who have stewarded this area for thousands of years. The community thrives thanks to their continued sharing of vision, wisdom, values, and leadership. We'd also like to acknowledge that we are hosting this webinar from the traditional lands of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people past and present. A few guidelines before I hand you over to our speaker. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we want to make sure everyone can hear our speaker. However, there's a box where you can write questions. We encourage you to ask them as we go and my colleague Chris Beyer and I will be keeping track of questions for Jesse. She'll stop every now and then and answer a few questions. We may not get to all of our questions, but we'll try to answer as many as we can. All right, I'll hand it over to Jesse to introduce herself. Thank you so much, Lisa, I appreciate it. And thanks to all of you who are dialing in from it sounds like all over the country, that's really cool. I'm gonna talk about snow in Alaska today and, uh, and talk a little bit about how I got started in science and where my career path has gone. I'm gonna talk about snow in the water cycle, uh, specifically in Alaska, uh, but some of that will also apply to um, all of those places where all of you are living, even Hawaii. And I'm gonna talk about different types of snow environments in Alaska, how we measure and forecast snow, and then what happens when the amount and the timing of snow changes. Next slide, please. Okay. So here's a picture of me when I was about three years old and uh, it was in my garden patch at my parents' house and I'm taking a look at a strawberry and it might be the first time I've ever seen a strawberry and I'm certainly uh, interested in what is this thing we call a strawberry? That's what we call uh, uh, the beginner's mind. When we're young, everything is new and interesting, um, but that's also a really good attitude and mind frame to take as, uh, as an adult throughout our lives. I, I try to maintain that same level of enthusiasm as a scientist and, uh, and meeting new people as I uh, travel in my career. So I grew up in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, I then left and went to college and graduate school in New York City, really different environment. Um, then in 2006, I came up to Alaska for a job as a, um, a postdoc, a postdoctoral researcher uh, at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. Um, because I'm a lifelong learner and wanted to enjoy uh, everything Alaska has to offer, I, I became an airplane pilot as well. And ultimately, I pulled that into uh, my, my research program. Um, currently, I, I work with NOAA, but I am also, uh, for my, my own interest, pursuing a legal study certificate through the University of Alaska, um, again, because I, I believe in constantly uh, learning new things, as I'm sure many of you do too. Next slide, please. Thanks, so in graduate school, I studied uh, climate science and oceanography, and I got a chance to spend a lot of time on American and Russian ships in the Arctic. 
and subarctic and actually even in the, the Caribbean. And so here's a picture of me. Um, I think we're in the central Arctic north of Siberia. And uh, I've got a, a team of international students helping me. We're doing some snow sampling there um, in front of the Kapitan Dernitsen. And, um, and that was a really cool opportunity. That was actually a, a, a summer school. It was summer at the time. This is about 2005. And um, it was a really great opportunity to meet uh, all, all kinds of young researchers from uh, Denmark and Canada and um, uh, Poland, I think in this case. Uh, I got lots of uh, op opportunities to travel uh, to meetings and field work throughout um, the world and in Alaska at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. We do a lot of collaboration with uh, scientists in Japan and uh, nowadays China as well in Korea um, and long term collaborations with Russians. This was a really great experience. Um, I got to do a lot of airborne research, fly around. I, I got my own airplane and put cameras and instruments inside to, to measure properties in the atmosphere and flew all over Alaska um, for NASA and other agencies. So these are all really um, neat opportunities that, that I got through my career in science. Uh, after about uh, 12 years in academia, then I moved to a, a federal position at uh, the National Weather Service, where now I serve as a, a hydrologist forecasting um, the, the river conditions throughout Alaska. Um, th these experiences also gave me the incredible opportunity to, um, to audition for the, the NASA um, astronaut program because I had that background in uh, science and aviation um, and, and engineering. And um, so I, I got a chance to uh, interview with um, NASA down in Houston uh, back in uh, 2012 and 2016. Next slide, please. So this is already a first, a first opportunity for you to ask any career questions before I launch into some of the science work. Anything about okay. uh, going to sea or flying science aircraft or, or anything else you might want to know? Um, I do. We, one of the, the questions that comes up quite a bit is um, kids wondering, what is your favorite thing about your job that you do right now? And what's a favorite thing about um, jobs that you've held in the past? Yeah, I think um, that's a really great question. So one of my favorite things throughout my science career has been um, collecting and then analyzing data, which sounds like it's a boring thing, but when you have um, a question about how something works in the environment, like uh, is it snowing more this decade than it did when I was a kid? That's a, that's a science question. How, how is the snowpack changing over the past 40 years? Um, the way you answer that is through data. And I think if you're an inquisitive person that wants to understand how our uh, environment works, that you will enjoy working with data. Um, and uh, I think th another thing I've really enjoyed throughout my career are the opportunities to travel, uh, especially when I was younger to do um, really adventurous uh, trips on, on, on boats and, and airplanes and hiking. And as I get older, I, I don't mind uh, scaling that back a little bit, but that's been a great opportunity. Great, and Michelle had wanted to know, um, are you a bush pilot? And another question was when you were a commercial airline pilot, where did you fly in Alaska? Sure, those are great questions, Michelle. So uh, yes, I'm a, I'm a bush pilot in the sense that uh, I've flown into um, the more rural communities in Alaska. Uh, I have a seaplane rating, so I have uh, the ability to fly on wheels as well as on floats into lakes and rivers. Um, I was a commercial pilot uh, for, uh, for myself. And so what that means is that uh, I can carry passengers and I can take uh, airborne um, measurements, either photographs or 
measurements of air chemistry, um, but I did not actually fly for an airline. Um, and so I am certified to just fly smaller aircraft and not the big jets quite yet. Thanks for your question. Great. Um, and then we have a couple of snow questions, but I think we might hold on to those until you've talked about the different kinds of snow that you have. Um, we did have one more question about your, you had talked about getting a legal studies certificate. And, and so what does a legal studies certificate let you do? Is it kind of like being a lawyer? So it's a little bit different than being a lawyer. Um, a legal studies certificate would, um, if I want to enable me to uh, to work as a paralegal in support of um, uh, legal work that would be supervised by a lawyer. So law school is a pretty long term uh, commitment of three years of school and uh, a lot of tuition and a legal studies certificate will give you an introduction to um, to law and uh, give you the opportunity to support the work of a lawyer or also legal counsel in your federal agency. Great. And then there is one more question about um, flying. And um, Carol had wanted to know whether you flew any emergency rescues. She was wondering whether um, whether there were like instances where animals needed to be flown out for emergency rescues or people maybe. Um, she was wondering about that. Yeah, I haven't. Uh done that work, but I do hope to um, have the opportunity to volunteer, especially with animal transport someday. Um, and that just requires that I have a certain number of flight hours um, before I can get uh, uh, signed up to transport uh, uh, animals for different volunteer organizations. Great. Well, we'll hold on to those other snow questions until you've talked about snow a little bit. So maybe we can go to the next section. Oh, Sounds and that's great. my cue, I guess, because I have to do the slides. <laughs> You're doing great. Thanks, Lisa. So probably a lot of you have seen a slide like this in your classrooms. This is sort of a, a standard schematic of, of how the uh, water cycle works. And um, uh, even in Hawaii, this is how the water cycle works. Uh, so I guess we can start by um, uh, what's happening today in Anchorage, which is that it's snowing out. And um, so uh, snow falls and uh, gathers on the ground. And if you are in a colder part of the state, that snow is going to stick around. Yeah. It might stick around for six months um, if it fell in the fall. Uh, but when it does melt, it's going to um, run off into um, what we call uh, surface water reservoirs, either rivers or streams or lakes. And it's also going to percolate into the soil. And there's a whole structure of, of water storage uh, in the ground, groundwater. Some of that uh, feeds um, our coastal areas in the ocean. Um, some of the surface water from rivers is going to run off into the ocean. And again, this varies a lot over, over the state of Alaska. If you're in Juneau in winter, you might still have quite a bit of snow melt, um, even in the middle of winter, right, right there in town. Uh, some of that uh, moisture from the snow uh, evaporates in that it, it changes into a liquid form and it can um, uplift and uh, condense back into clouds and continue to snow more or rain more. Um, it can also uh, sublimate which is to go from directly from snow um, uh, uh, into the gaseous form without going through a liquid uh, 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 conversion. Um, and then the other, another important role that the um, that snow plays in the uh, in the water cycle is that it 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 interacts with the energy cycle in in Earth in that it. Um, snow is very bright white and it reflects a lot of the incoming um, sunlight and um, and and so it, it it changes the way that uh, heat moves around uh, in the atmosphere um, so that when we don't have snow more of the sunlight gets absorbed in the land surface 
and um, can do things like uh, uh, thaw out permafrost um, in our cold regions and, and such. Um, then of course, water uh, interacts with plants and um, gets, gets taken up into plants. Snow also falls on plants and it can actually um, protect the plant during the coldest parts of winter. And in parts of the state uh, where you don't have a lot of trees, uh, the wind will blow snow around and it will get caught in plants. And that's actually a sort of a strategy for the plant to, to hold on to that moisture um, in the springtime. It's gonna it uptake a lot of that moisture. Um, and, uh, and then it can actually, that helps the plant reproduce and become bigger. Um, there's changes in, in storage too in Alaska. Um, uh, and and uh, most of that snow is gonna get stored over the whole winter and then it all kind of melts in the spring. Where in other parts of the world, um, those of you who are in Texas and are getting maybe getting some snow and ice this week, um, that's gonna melt right away if it hasn't already. Um, Massachusetts uh, kind of comes and goes. Um, Hawaii, you have to be, at the very tippy top of your uh, volcanoes to get some of that snow and it uh, will typically, um, uh, most of that melts off. Uh, and then of course, uh, water plays a really important role in, um, in resources that we drink and that we use for uh, uh, washing and, and bathing and such. So I'll talk more about that. Next slide, please. So here I'm just going to talk a little bit about snow in different uh, environments in Alaska. Um, some of you might recognize this big city here. This is Juneau, so it's right on the on the ocean, and there's a lot of um, dramatic uh, uh, mountains right behind Juneau. The city is really tucked in against that uh, uh, those tall mountains, and here's a snow scene, and um, you can see that. Uh, there's snow caught on some of these very steep uh, faces of those mountains. Um, avalanches are very common in, in steep mountains, and that's why you don't see a lot of trees here in, in Juneau above um, a certain level. You can see that there's uh, maybe some snow trapped in the trees, maybe there's some snow under the trees. Um, but because the ocean is right there and it's warm, we don't typically see sea ice there in Juneau. Um, it's really hard for downtown Juneau to get really cold because that, that ocean is a source of, of um, heat, but it's also a source of moisture. And so when you get winds that um, blow uh, 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 across the ocean, they, um, they have a lot of moisture and they can uh, contribute to snowfall there. Um, is that moisture gets, that wind pushes uh, that, those air masses up the mountains. Uh, they, they actually cool as that air mass goes up and that cooling um, can contribute to snowfall. I'll show another slide about that in a minute. Next slide. Here's another city in Alaska. Those of you who are calling in from there might recognize Nome. And, uh, and this is a picture um, uh, from the sea ice, then looking, looking into town. And um, snow on sea ice is really different than that snow in, in Juneau, right? Here you have um, ice ridges that have formed. Uh, you have a windy environment and um, uh, not very many trees. And so um, that that sea ice really um, really acts like another piece of land in the sense that um, you don't have that same source of uh, moisture when the ice is really um, uh, really solid. And so you get instead a, a, a dry environment right on the ocean. Um, there's not a, a really heavy snowpack. You don't see five feet of snow here. If you do, it's because it blew and it piled up against a ridge. So this tends to be uh, low, low snow amounts, dry and windblown. Next slide, please. Okay. Here's another different snow environment. So those of you who are calling in from the interior of Alaska might recognize um, this type of scene. 
I think this is from near um, Fairbanks, but it kind of looks similar throughout the interior. You have some black, small black spruce trees, and um, the those have what we would call intercepted the snow as it came down. It kind of trees got in the way, and the snow is hanging out there. You have some snow on the ground, um, but it's not like 10 feet of snow. It's again, it's a pretty relatively dry environment in the interior. That snow is going to stick around all winter because it's cold. Um, but the other thing you notice too is that uh, uh, the the snow is kind of like just sitting there. So if it were a windy environment, it would have been blown out of those trees. So that's another thing with um, the climate in the interior of Alaska, you have very stable um, atmospheres during the winter. Typically, you don't typically see a lot of wind. And so the snow can stick on the trees like that for a while. Next slide, please. So oh, here's sorry. another, go ahead. There we go. Um, <laughs> there's, this is a picture that I took um, up near um, uh, in the Prudhoe Bay oil fields, uh, pretty close to Nuiqsut. I don't know if anyone's calling in from the North Slope today, but um, it can get very windy up there and snow can get uh, transported a really, really long ways. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about instrumentation in a minute, but these are, um, these are both precipitation gauges and they have um, wind shields around them that try to improve the quality of those measurements. Uh, here you can see a little bit of the oil pipeline in the background. Um, again, you, you tend to have um, pretty shallow snowpacks. Um, when, when the ice is solidly packed in, uh, uh, in the Chukchi and, and Beaufort seas, then you, um, uh, then this can be a pretty dry environment um, without a lot of open leads. All right, so those are just some examples um, of, of different snowpacks in the state and kind of what they look like. Um, and then we're gonna get into trying to measure some of those, but I'll take any questions you have um, right now. So um, Jesse, one of the questions um, was about the quality of the snow. So you showed a lot of different um, kind of environments where the snow falls in different ways, but um, you know, sometimes when snow falls, it can be really small, the flakes can be really small and light and other times they can be really big. And is that due to the moisture content? Um, and do you have a way of, of measuring that kind of quality with the snow? Yeah, that yeah. can be um, caused by a number of, of factors. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but Generally, it has to do with, um, yeah, how warm the atmosphere is. Uh, the warmer it is, typically the bigger snowflakes you get. Um, the colder it is, the, the smaller they are. Um, and then uh, once that snow falls on the, on the ground, um, the size of those particles impact too and, and their weight and how much moisture, then how much um, water is actually, frozen water is in the, in the snowpack. And we call that the um, the snow water equivalent, which is a lot of words, but um, it basically is is just how how dense the pack is. Is it light and fluffy, or um, hard and crunchy, or the snow particles so small that they can can pack in up against the sea ice? Um, so those are. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into measurement here. But that's a great question. Okay, great. Um, and then Michelle, the Nelson family from Hawaii was asking, have you ever been stuck in a blizzard when you're out looking at snow? Definitely. <laughs> so uh, uh, blizzards are very dangerous. Um, you can also get low visibility um, when it's just snowing and you're driving because you're, you're driving into the snow, even if it's not um, uh, blowing. Um, which is what you need to have a, 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 a blizzard by definition. There has to be a certain amount of wind, um, but there's an apparent motion when you're, um, if you're in a car or an airplane that, uh, that makes it appear like you're in a blizzard and can be very uh, dangerous. So yeah, you have to be really careful. And if you absolutely have to drive in a, in a blizzard, 
um, it's good to be um, packing all your emergency gear in your in your car or however you're traveling. Great, and I know that you're going to get, be getting into um, snow measurement. Carol had a couple of questions about um, snowfall equivalent. Um, and so is that something that you're going to be talking about in the next section or? Yeah, let me get to a few more slides. And if I haven't answered that question by the next break we have for questions, please bring it back up. Okay, and then um, Mark had been wondering what are typical ratios of snow to water in the in the various environments. I don't know whether that's too technical of a question or whether you can answer it generally. Yeah, um, the classic rule of thumb is um, is one to ten. So if you had uh, a ten inches of snow, you would melt that and it would form one inch of water in a any kind of um, gauge. Uh, or measuring cup kind of device, um, but that's a rough estimate. And that um, actually that kind of ratio um, varies a lot around the state. And, um, but it will kind of be consistent at the different times of year um, in different locations. So um, the North Slope might have um, uh, small particles and, and dense and a it'll be kind of the same density the next year and the same thing with different um, regions of the state. Um, great, and then uh, Michelle, another Michelle from Hawaii was asking in Prudhoe Bay, does the snow cover the buildings there or were that was that just instruments um, sticking up above the snow? Yeah, and that picture that was just instruments sticking out above the snow, but, um, but a lot of engineers in Alaska, when they're designing buildings, really want to know what, what what the snow load is. So, how much a roof can hold on a building, and that's an example of um, a great career for someone who's interested in snow. You might become a an engineer who um, designs the um, snow load um, uh, designs for for buildings here in Alaska. So that means that you need a roof that's strong enough to hold the amount of snow that typically falls in that community. And that can vary a lot, I'm, I would imagine, from community to community. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. And if those buildings are, are public health facilities or, or something like that, um, that's why actually the um, Alaska Native Health Consortium gets involved in uh, snow engineering for that exact reason. They don't want the, the roof to cave in on any of their clinics anywhere in the state. So um, that's a really important job. Great. All right. Well, let's get into some of the measurement um, descriptions that you have here. Great. Thanks, Lisa. Well, there are a lot of different ways to measure snow. And unfortunately, none of them work perfectly. So I'm just going to provide a couple different examples um, on gauges that uh, I've worked on or which are kind of like what the weather service uses. Um, so in the um, left uh, side of the slide is the GeoNOR gauge. And that so is, um, yeah, that is the type of gauge which is, is um, a form of weighing, and so the um, the snow falls into this can that in this photo is surrounded by a couple of windshields, and then the weight of that snow um, registers then on a data computer that's logging the the basically um, uh, completion of an electrical circuit that tells how much um, that snow weighs. So you don't know um, how many inches of snow fell in the case of a precipitation gauge, but you do know that snow water equivalent because the, um, the gauge is, is based on a weight measurement, a mass measurement. Um, the idea behind these, um, these shields is that uh, when the wind is blowing around a gauge that's kind of shaped like uh, my, my water cup, actually the presence of um, the gauge itself uh, actually like deforms the flow of air over it and makes snow preferentially not fall into the gauge. 
and so um, those uh, those shields um, generate these little vortices around and kind of break that down and make it so the snow is better at falling inside the the, the bucket. Basically, um, I have another picture, the one that's uh, kind of a black fluted um, gauge in the middle there. That's called a knifer gauge. And um, you can see that it doesn't have a, a, a shield with those um, moving pieces, but it has this, this funny shaped gauge. That's another way of trying to compensate for that, um, that wind bias. Um, but uh, uh, again, it's a type of um, weighing gauge too. Yeah. Um, most of what we use in the, in the winter um, is some kind of weighing gauge. We have other gauges that when a certain amount of snow falls in it or rain, um, then the gauge tips over um, like a little, um, a little scale. And it's, um, those don't work very well for snow. Uh, because the snow just kind of sticks to the, the tipper and it doesn't go anywhere. Um, so those are ways of measuring snowfall. And sometimes those will have um, a heat, like a heated wire that goes around the edge of the, the gauge too. Um, but that takes a lot of electricity. And so it's hard to do that in a, a remote location on the side of a mountain or, or whatnot. Another thing that we measure, so those are, um, that's how much uh, uh, snow water equivalent fell. Um, other things that we want to know are the snow depth that fell um, and, um, and then how much is sitting on the ground. So those are two kind of different things. So how much, how many inches of snow fell and then uh, how many inches of snow are on the ground. Um, so. The way we do that in the weather service is that um, there's something called a snowboard and it gets um, uh, set down prior to an event. This one's set down on the ground, but you can also have them up on a little stand. Um, and then in anticipation of a, a, a snow event, we'll make sure that's all clear and then the snow will fall and then someone goes out with a, a kind of ruler and then measures how much snow fell during that storm, and then they're gonna clear it off. So that's a snow fall measurement on a snow board. Now, if you just wanna go and measure how much snow is in the snowpack, and those of you in snowy regions of the state might do this for a school project, um, you can just take a ruler and go and measure how much is sitting on the ground which is probably how much has been sitting there, you know, how much is built up all winter. And so the snow falls and it's kind of fluffy. And then after a few days, it starts to compact. And so even though your snow hasn't necessarily melted, it might have gone from a big fluffy snowpack into a, a denser um, kind of icy um, snowpack. And so, um, yeah, that's a little bit about, uh, we use very basic tools like rulers. There's also um, some more automated sensors that measure depth through sound with a, um, a, a ultrasonic pulse. Um, and, uh, and and those can run in, a, in an automated weather station. But at a lot of weather forecast offices, um, we do these very um, simple measurements and we have um, folks who are cooperative observers um, or COCORAS observers. Those are both programs in the weather service where, where um, citizen scientists like yourselves can take these kind of measurements and submit them to the weather service. All right, um, okay. next slide. So um, another thing we do is that uh, gets back to this question of snow water equivalent. So I talked about the snow that falls into a gauge and we can measure maybe on an hourly basis or a daily basis, the weight of the precipitation that fell and it might be solid, it might be liquid, it might be a combination of both. Um, and we talked about using a ruler to measure the snow that's on the ground in the snowpack. Um, but how do we know how much water is in the snowpack? What's that snow water equivalent? Um, 
in that sense, we have to collect that snow and then weigh that. Um, this is what we use um, a snow sampling tube for, and those might be called a snow coring tube. And um, basically you're gonna, um, there's a little handle there and uh, you're gonna shove that coring tube into the ground and twist it a little bit and, and pull it out. And um, there's a, uh, a ruler on the side and that's gonna tell you um, how deep that pack was in inches. And then you're gonna weigh the whole snow core and subtract the weight of this aluminum stuff and then you're gonna know how much your, your pack weighs. And so um, that's a very manual technique that's used by the, um, uh, the Department of Agriculture uh, to help um, the Weather Service um, estimate the uh, water supply. So we partner with um, uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service to uh, take those, those snow course measurements at the start of each month of spring um, here throughout the West, but also Alaska. Um, now there's a, also a way to do that in an automated sense. So the snow core is very manual measurement. In an automated sense, we use something called a snow pillow, which is uh, uh, basically a big thing that looks like a pillow that's um, either made of stainless steel or rubber or something else that's sealed. And then the snow is gonna fall on that pillow and it's the pillow is full of um, a liquid, uh, an antifreeze liquid. So that liquid is not gonna freeze. And then the weight of the snow is going to put pressure on that pillow. And from that um, pressure, we can take a measurement of, of that and then also know how much water is in that snowpack. So that's a snow pillow. And, um, and and we can uh, automate those measurements and transmit the data over satellite and get those here in the office. So um, I think next we're gonna show you a little bit of a video on how the snow core works. Um, and that'll, that'll hopefully make a little bit more sense when you see it in action. Okay, so, so I'm just going to load up the, the video here and I just wanted to remind you that um, when I start the video, it'll automatically mute you. So if you want to talk okay. to narrate some of it, you'll have to remember to mute, to unmute yourself. Um, here we go. So let me get this. There we go. So you'll have to unmute yourself here. So this is my coworker, Kyle, and he's using the snow coring tube and he's going taking measurements along a, a predetermined path. And then he's using this little spring scale to weigh how much that, um, that whole contraption weighs. Lisa, maybe you could run through it one more time. It goes yeah, pretty I'm fast. See whether, okay, here we go. And so he knows how much the, the, the metal core work weighs. And so he subtracts that and that's how much the snow weighs. And then he writes it down in a little book and he transmits it um, uh, to our, our coordinator then at the Department of Agriculture. So that's a snow survey. Those are done at the first of the month uh, all over Alaska and um, the Western US. So one question that came actually right from that video was, is he emptying out the tube every time? Is that what he does as he's shaking the tube? Exactly. Yep. Yep. So he's looking to see what the height of the snow was relative to the tube and, and then taking that weight measurement. So the other technique we use for measuring snow um, are satellites. And uh, when we have enough sunlight, we can see uh, how much snow cover there is. That's the most accurate measure. Um, and then we can try to estimate things like the snow water equivalent by using different satellite sensors, um, uh, but that doesn't work that doesn't uh, perfectly. Uh, perfectly. So that's why those, uh, those uh, manual, uh, and, manual and, and other, other instrument, instrument measurements are really important. All right, I think we have another break for questions here on snow measurement. Okay, I'm gonna make you full screen here so that uh, folks can see you. and. 
So um, Idan from Germany was asking, how do you measure snow temperature? Because I think that there was a picture next to the snow pillow where you had a temperature gauge. And I think that was one of the things he was wondering. Yeah, and so um, at those stations where we measure snowpack, we also take air temperature measurements. Um, and so we have a whole sense of, um, and those will also have a precipitation gauge. So that, that site then will have all of those different measurements. And for example, we want to know um, if it's 40 degrees at that station, when the precipitation falls, it's probably not falling as snow, it's probably um, falling as rain. So that's one of the things we want to know. Um, taking the temperature of snow itself is, um, is important for research, uh, but we do not typically do that um, in forecasting at, the, at this time. Maybe someday we will. And then Carol had had a couple of questions about snow equivalent, which I think you described pretty well with your snow measurements. But um, is you described the way that the Weather Service does snow um, snowfall equivalents. Is that an international method of measuring? Is it consistent across countries? It is, yeah. Different countries have different styles of precipitation gauges, but the, um, the techniques are the same. And so, you know, I encourage you, if you, um, if you can, to, um, to go and take some snow samples, maybe with a, um, a coffee can or something and a measuring cup and just experiment, you know, for, for one measuring cup full of snow, um, you could put it in a plastic bag and put it on a kitchen scale and you might get a, a bunch of different weights depending on how dense that snow is. So that's something you can practice um, at home or in your classroom. Great, and then um, is there a place online where where folks can get a snowfall equivalent? Is, it, is there something on the Weather Service um, website where you, we, you can get those kind of measurements? Yeah, so at our website, which is weather.gov uh, slash A-P-R-F-C, uh, there is a, um, a tab called water supply, and you can see um, the, the snow water equivalent measurements there. Great, and we do have a, a, a link to your website on our NOAA Live Alaska website. So um, I'll also add the link to the water supply tab as well. So I know you have a couple other sections to go. We have about 18 more minutes. So I think maybe we should probably keep going to the next section and I will share my screen again. Here we go. Great. So I'll talk just for a few minutes here on um, how we forecast snow. And we've, we've gotten into some of this. Um, winter precipitation isn't just snow, but it can be um, sleet. It can be freezing rain. And you can also get rain in, in winter as well. Um, and so to get the snow correct, we have to get both the weather right and that temperature has to be right on, especially if it's near the freezing threshold. Um, and then we have to get the pathway of the storm right and all those things. So it's it's a kind of a tricky thing to measure, especially in uh, parts of Alaska where we don't have a lot of measurements. Next slide, please. Let's see. So we use a lot of computers at the Weather Service to do our forecasting. So we have information about weather models have different weather models. We have satellite data. We have um, uh, a lot of information that helps us forecast the weather. And then once we know what the incoming snow is going to be, um, or we guess, then we put it into our hydrology model. And that tells us how much of that snow might be melting and going into the rivers and lakes, um, ocean, and how much of it's just gonna stick on the land surface at that time. Next slide. So here I, I pulled a couple of slides specifically for Alaska about some of these kind of common um, storm systems we get. And so when you um, hear or read about uh, lows in the Gulf of Alaska, um, typically there's also a low kind of sitting on the Aleutians. 
Um, these set up certain storm tracks in winter, um, and these can lead to some really big um, uh, snowfall uh, events, especially along the, the Gulf Coast of Alaska. Next slide. So I mentioned this a little bit earlier when we were uh, talking about Juno, but um, in that Gulf Coast where you have a lot of uh, mountains because of the uh, uh, continental plates uh, shifting there, and there's a lot of volcanoes and steep mountains, you get uh, the wind comes in from the Gulf and it pushes uh, air up those mountains and that's where it cools and it contributes to uh, snowfall in the mountains. And it also means that the, the mountains, um, the side that's closest to where that wind comes in, uh, typically on the south side there in the Gulf, um, is a lot wetter. And then on the other side of the mountains um, are, are drier and get less snow. So here in Anchorage, we talk about um, a downslope effect where we don't get very much snow in, in the Anchorage Bowl, um, whereas they got a whole lot over in Turnigan Arm. So next slide. Let's go ahead and skip this section, Lisa, if we could, and we'll come to questions. I could just have a couple more slides and we'll sure. have more room for questions at the end. So I just want to mention here, what happens when the amount and timing of snow changes? Um, well, we know that snow is a really important habitat for a lot of our animals in Alaska. Uh, polar bears, foxes, marine mammals um, on the ice, um, snowy owls, uh, all of those things, those are important um, habitats. So when snow arrives later or there's not very much snow or maybe there's um, rain that falls on the snow and creates a really thick layer of ice, that's pretty hard on um, caribou. So those, um, anything that depends on snow uh, for its habitat is, is impacted. Next slide. These also include um, small mammals that we don't think about as often and, and other organisms like um, microorganisms in the soil as well are, are impacted if, for example, the snowpack arrives really late in the season. Next slide. I mentioned a little bit about uh, plants and snow earlier. Um, this is a, a picture of the tundra where um, uh, bushes tend to stop snow and windblown environments and kind of hold on to it. And that um, the more snow they get, actually, the bigger the bush gets and it starts to expand. And um, that's a phenomenon that's happening across the, um, the Arctic called uh, shrubification. And so the changes in the snow cycle are creating changes in the um, in the plants, what plants grow where, part of climate change. Next slide, please. Um, snow is a really important source of drinking water for a lot of our communities. Uh, this is a satellite picture of Utkiagvik, and um, there, uh, uh, the Isakwak uh, Lagoon is the source for fresh water. And, um, and that lagoon is uh, recharged by snow that melts directly into it and snow and rain that, that recharge the uh, groundwater. And so if, um, if you didn't get any rain or snow, uh, those um, surface water sources that are fed by groundwater sources, that dries up and all of a sudden you have a, um, a hard time getting drinking water or you need to pump it from other sources. Etc. So if the amounts and timing of, of snow and, and rain change, that has a big impact. Next slide. Um, snow is really important for travel as well in our rural communities. Um, people use um, snow machines and, um, and dog teams and other uh, uh, technologies that need um, snow. They don't, they don't work on bare ground. And so uh, again, if snowfall changes, um, then that affects travelers. Next slide, please. Uh, it's also important for recreation. Uh, we like to get out in the snow and play. We like to get exercise in the snow. Um, people get serious about snow sports or they just go out for fun. 
So um, if snow doesn't fall and there's no, uh, there's no ski trails and there's no way to build a, uh, a snow fort, then, uh, then it, it impacts our happiness too. So I think, is that my last slide here? I think I just have a summary. Um, so I talked a little bit about uh, different careers, including my own, but some others that relate to snow, uh, ranging from research and forecasting to um, maybe you want to run a snow removal business. That's a really important role. Um, and water supply managers or uh, uh, snow roof loading engineers. Um, snow has a key role in the water cycle in Alaska, but in, in many places. Um, there are different types of snow, different densities, um, different ways that snow interacts in our environments. I talked just a little bit about how we measure and forecast snow at the weather service, and then how when the amount and timing of snow changes, people, plants, and animals are all impacted. I think I have a few more minutes for other questions then. So one of the questions actually that came up is that is, um, Clary had wondered um, how deep will the snow get this winter, but I guess a more general way of looking at that question also is, has there been, have you as a forecaster seen that there's been trends over the last 10 years or so in terms of the amount of snow that's, that, that you've been keeping track of? Yeah. Um... I sort of glossed over this, but um, the the accuracy with which we estimate our snowpacks is not that great. Um, we could use a lot more measurements, and um, the measurements uh, date back in a few places for 100 years. I think the Nome record goes back to 2006, but we don't have very long, um, high-quality records in very many communities. Um, and you can imagine for the the Department of Agriculture to go out, um, you know, in a helicopter and take all those snow courses, um, they don't they don't take nearly as many as we'd like. Um, I think theoretically we would expect that as the climate warms, that more moisture is going to be transported into Alaska. Most of that warming has occurred in winter. And so we anticipate that the biggest increases in precipitation will also be in winter. I think we're starting to see that um, in the years that we've had some pretty heavy snow loads in interior Alaska. Last winter, we had a lot of snow in the interior. Um, changes in sea ice cover impact um, the snow in our coastal communities. Um, it's warmer in those communities. So when we have precipitation events right around freezing, um, they might fall as rain instead of snow now. Um, but when the snow, when the sea ice is not a solid pack, it has a bunch of open leads, that becomes a moisture source near the coast and um, can contribute to more sort of what we call lake effect snow which is um, what we see in Southeast Alaska too. You have a big source of moisture, which is there the ocean. Um, and, um, and when it's cold and the wind's blowing, that's like a snow generating machine. So um, it's an ambiguous answer that the science people have been trying, I've spent my whole career trying to look for trends in the snowpack in Alaska. And it's, um, it's difficult to detect with the measurements we have, but we, think that the theory is starting to um, um, come to bear that uh, snow loads are increasing mostly in the northern part of the state. So actually you had mentioned a, a program called COCORAS and um, could you describe that a little bit for our viewers because that might be a way to to get people involved in in measuring snow in their their local areas. Yeah um, and we I can send you a link that you can put up on the website, but that is, um, it's like the um, co-op program in that it's a volunteer program that the Weather Service organizes, but the um, equipment is not um, quite as complicated as a co-op station. I think it's a little bit more portable. And so um, I think there's training available and um, we actually have a, um, uh, in our uh, Arctic region downtown have a, 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 a person who's in charge of getting new COCO-RAS observers signed up and trained and get the equipment sent out to them. So I can 
um, anyone who's interested, I could put them in touch with um, Doug is his name. Yeah, I think we had put a, a link to the Cocoa Raz site onto our NOAA Live Alaska okay. website. So, um, but for schools who are interested in getting into measuring snow in their areas, um, it's a great project to get into and a way to, to track what the snow is like in your own area so that you can report that out to people in your community as well. That'd be great. So um, let's see. So Carol had wanted to know when does the snow start to turn to ice and whether there's a particular temperature where that happens or whether that's dependent on things like what you were talking about, whether whether um, it's uh, the area is close to a water source or um, the environment. Yeah, of course, um, snow is ice, it's frozen water, but uh, when it compacts into like a dense, um, uh, more like a block of ice is probably what you mean. And that, um, that tends to happen in spring. And of course, um, it tends to happen uh, uh, when temperatures get closer to, um, to, to freezing, to melting levels. Um, then what happens is the snowpack, which has sort of this temperature gradient in it, uh, tends to go isothermal, where the whole pack becomes right around freezing. And that's when we say it's ripe, just like a ripe piece of fruit, that that snowpack is ripe and it's ready to melt. And it's going to have some liquid water in it that will tend to fall out the bottom of the pack. Um, but you know, I have also been up on the Prudhoe Bay oil fields at uh, 20 below and seen the sun shining right onto the ice roads. Guess what? It's melting. Like there is melts just from um, the sun shining radiation. Um, something that you'll also notice in the springtime um, is that uh, after afternoon melt, you'll get some um, clouds at night because that moisture um, uh, it evaporated or sublimated, and then it condensed back into clouds in the atmosphere. Those clouds are going to trap more heat during the night um, through a long wave radiation and, and keep it warm. And so that's how you kind of get that spring melt going. Um, but uh, generally to really get a, a real icy pack, you either have to have a lot of sun that's really beating down on the pack for a while, um, or you have to get right around, um, air temperatures right around uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Great. Well, I think we're coming to the end of our time here. So um, thank you so much for coming onto our webinar series and talking about snow measurements. I think we learned a lot about different types of snow and different types of environments. And, and also I think that it, that it kind of underlined that everything, the, the environment that, that the snow is falling in, the ocean, um, the wind, it's all interconnected into the influence of snow in the water cycle. So I really appreciate you bringing that to our attention. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for having me and for uh, the students and their families who got uh, and teachers who got a chance to call in today. Great. Thank you so much for all of your attention. And next week we will have a NOAA Live Alaska webinar on um, sea lion, stellar sea lion entanglement and ocean guardian schools. So thank you. And thank you, Jesse. And um, we'll see you next week. All right. Bye bye, everyone.